Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we're talking to Travis Watson. Travis is the horticulture manager at East Tennessee State University. He also recently completed his thesis research on the types of factors that make pollinator gardens more attractive to pollinators. Hi Travis, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi Shannon, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation because many of us are interested in pollinator gardening and we wanna create better habitats on our property. And as you and I were talking before we started the recording, there is practically an endless supply of general information out there about creating pollinator gardens. And some of it's really, really good. But as a scientist, one of the things that I'm always looking for is research-backed information. And I like to be able to really read the science and dig into that more in-depth research and looking at how to improve my pollinator gardens and my habitat and what I can do specifically as an individual. But unfortunately, a lot of times it's really hard to find that research or it hasn't been done, especially in the U.S. or like where I live in the Eastern U.S. Because if I'm creating pollinator habitat, obviously I need it to be applicable to where I live. So that's one of the reasons why I was so excited to find your research. And I wanted to talk to you because you have done research on just that here in the Eastern US and looking at pollinator gardens and how we can make them more attractive to pollinators and all that kind of cool stuff. But before we dig into your research, I wanna take a few minutes to just tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do. Awesome. Very good. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited to talk to everybody today. I'm the horticulture manager for a regional university in East Tennessee. So I'm responsible for all of the maintenance and upkeep of our tree program, our flower program, and our shrubbery program. I've been there for 16 years. I've got a little over 20 years in the green industry, um, bouncing back and forth between nursery work and grounds management, which is what I'm doing now. At ETSU, I got involved with a uh, research lab that was um, focused on pollinator research. Wasn't an area that I had any interest in up to that point. I was, I was really the tree guy. I've been fascinated with trees. I'm still super fascinated by trees. But um, speaking with my advisor, Dr. Arceo, and talking about my options for thesis projects, I, I, I really just didn't have a clue. And, um, but his lab was the best fit for me because I was a plant guy and, and he's, his, his lab was doing plant ecology work. And that's, that's where I wanted to be. I, I wanted to be involved with plant ecology in any way I could. So I got involved with their lab and um, really just uh, my first summer there, I helped another grad student uh, spent the, the summer in the field, collecting insects, identifying them, categorizing them and, and doing all kinds of fun things with insects. And so I really just took a, an interest in it and started researching pollinators, insects, insect decline, and, and, and really got my head around the, some of the major issues that we're facing right now. And as I started into that research, it, it, it hit me like a, a ton of bricks. This is probably one of the most critical issues on our planet right now. If, if we realize a collapse in, in our insect population, everything will cascade down with it. So it got my interest. It snapped me out of the trees. And mm -hmm. I was like, all right, well, let's do this. I said, but this isn't, you know, this isn't my area. And if we're gonna do something, I, I wanna do something that has community impact. I, I, I don't want to spend two years of my life researching, doing uh, all of this work just to contribute to our broader understanding of scientific knowledge. I said, I need, I need something that I can give back to my community with. And so we were talking and he says, well, what about pollinator gardens? I said, well, what about them? You know, there's a lot of people making pollinator gardens. He says, no, but you know, the ecological aspects of pollinator gardens are, are very interesting. And there are a lot of people planting gardens, but 
we really don't know if they're doing any good. And I was like, wow, you know, that's, that's a good point. I said, um, I've not come across any studies that were focused solely on pollinator gardens. And that, that's got some community ties. It's got some good uh, potential for citizen science involvement. And we can really grow this and involve students and, and children and, and, and maybe make a difference. So I got my head behind it and I set out to uh, take a look at what was going on with pollinator gardens in our region. And we fo I focused on our region and I tried to capture as much of the variation that's going on out there in the wild or in, in our communities. So much of scientific research is you have to have controls and, and um, the, the experimental process is, is designed to not be favorable for these broad ecological studies, but we really needed a broad ecological study. We needed that variation. We needed to see how all of these different guidelines that you mentioned, um, how they're being interpreted and how they're being applied. And then we need to say, okay, this is what we have. How is it affecting our pollinator community? So that was a pretty, pretty broad goal, big project. Big project, yes. It was a lot of fun. And we, we ended up working with municipal organizations, with community groups and individuals. So I was visiting people's yards, churches, large state plantings up in Roan Mountain to try to see what are people doing? And everybody has a little bit different approach. Yes. And that's one of the great things about pollinator gardens. And from the scientific point, one of the most challenging for studying it is that we're all doing our own thing in many ways. So everybody's backyard or front yard or 40 acres or quarter acre or whatever you've got is different. And we've all got different interests. And because we are planting around our built landscapes, they look very different than the natural communities because they also take into account our own aesthetics, any regulations that are out there as far as homeowners associations or anything else, they're all unique. They're all different. So yes. And like I said, one of the things that drew me to your research was because it was this very applicable project, very difficult um, from a scientific perspective, but also very valuable from the hands-on standpoint and something that I think we can all benefit from. Yes. And I, so I tried very hard to, to find these broad patterns that anyone can apply to any space. Mm -hmm. and that was what I was really looking for when I set out on this project is just, let's figure out what matters most. There's so many factors to consider, but, but what matters most? What are the things that people can do that will make a difference in their yard? And I think one of the things that we might wanna talk about pretty early on here because we keep talking pollinator gardens and pollinators and we all have that tendency to kind of lump all pollinators together yes but they're very very different <laughs> absolutely and that's um that's such a critical point when we when we start talking about designing pollinator gardens and and mitigating insect decline pollinators that's an easy word to use um, I throw it around a lot. When I use the term pollinators, it's an all-inclusive term for me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even limit that, applying that term to insects that are directly related to pollination services. There are a lot of facilitators out there, and there, there are parasitoids, there are other organisms that, that function within these, these same networks that are just as critical to pollination services and to plant diversity because we can't separate those two either. Pollinators and pollination, that's what's responsible for all of the beautiful flowers we have out there. Flowers don't change colors, patterns, or style because humans appreciate them. They're functional um, aspects of those organisms. So all of our plant diversity, we owe to insect pollinators. Or, or other pollinators, don't again, I'm again with the insects. We're, bats are pollinators, birds are pollinators. There are tons of mammals that are pollinators. It, yeah. It's just not the type of bubble or box that you wanna to try to start lumping things into. It's, no. it's, a huge, it's a huge network. Right, and here in the Eastern US, it's 
even easier to think just insects because in the eastern U.S., well, we do have primarily insect pollinators. I mean, hummingbirds are really our only non-insect pollinator that we have because our bats all, are all insectivorous. You don't get into the pollinating bats until you get more southwest right. and other parts of the world as well. So we do have a very insect biased view here, but still even within the insects, I mean, there are just so many different types and it goes beyond bees and butterflies and so much further than that. And then, then everything you find on the flowers, even if they're drinking the nectar, they may not be pollinators. They could just be flower visitors and it just gets all complicated. But with your research, how did you define pollinator and how did you break that up? For my, my project, we, I focused on insects. They were the easiest to record um, and they're the ones that get the majority of the scientific interest right now. So I focused on insects as a whole as pollinators. So I was recording contact with floral reproductive parts. So all of the insect observations that I made were true pollinators. Um, they weren't all flighted insects. Some were ground insects, beetles. The only thing was that they had to main, they had to contact the flower. And again, as like you said, bees and butterflies get the majority of the attention in pollinator conservation efforts right now. So I wanted to look at bees and butterflies. I intended to look at bumblebees as a separate group, honeybees as a separate group, and then the other bees. But that year, 2019, I recorded very few Apis mellifera, our, our European honeybee visits to the point I found, I found honeybees, I think at two sites, and they were so underrepresented in the data set that they, it wasn't even viable to include them. That data got lumped in with other bees. So for some reason, 2019 was a really off year for, for honeybees, but it was a great year for a lot of other insects. I saw so many sweat bees and the little um, mason bees and just all of our little native bees were flourishing that year. So I, I looked at bumblebees as a separate group because in the bee group, they are pretty much a standout. They have the longest flight distance, foraging range, they have the long, you know, largest body size. These are all functional aspects of that insect that make them somewhat different than the rest of that group. So we looked at them separately, but we lumped the rest of the bees in together. For the most part, those are all of our native bees and, and they're the ground dwelling bees and they're the semi-social bees, eusocial bees and solitary bees. So there wasn't a lot of distinguishing between that group, but the fact that they were bees and they were easily distinguishable in the field because we didn't have time to identify every insect that was flying by touching flower part. No. But the other thing I included in this, in these groups was other insects. So we included the beetles and the ants and the other things that are, that contribute to pollination, but aren't really looked at. We collected all of the data. And then when we started breaking it down, it became very clear that the differences that we were seeing uh, between these sites were a lot more evident in the composition of the insect groups. Overall abundance was the same no matter where we went. These gardens were loaded with insects. Some had more than others, but the relative abundance of insects to flowers, it was pretty much the same across the board. The things that were different were what types of insects were present in that garden. Some insects had higher proportions of bumblebees. Others had higher proportions of these other insect types. We really wanted to tease apart what aspects of these gardens could have those types of influences. We looked at garden size, which gets a lot of attention. There's a lot of research out there that alludes to the fact that larger patch sizes could anticipate higher abundance and diversity. I didn't see that in my research. But we looked at also another thing we looked at was proximity to, to undisturbed woodlands, which is something that, again, it's, it's very prevalent in the research. Uh, habitat connectivity is, is huge for certain insect groups and their ability to travel between sites. So I looked at that. How far away from the woods is the garden? And does that, does that make a difference in what insects are present in the garden? We, of course, looked at you know, what plants are there, how many flowers were present. So we looked at floral densities, how many flowers per size. And then we looked at the species composition. 
what what flowers were there. And in that, I looked at two metrics. I looked at floral symmetry. Most flowers can be broken down into two major groups. They're either radially symmetrical like a sunflower or they're bilaterally symmetrical like mint. You can split it down the middle. So that was a pretty major division. But radial flower types tend to be associated with generalist insects, not very discriminatory. They'll visit multiple flower types. Um, it's a very receptive floral structure for a lot of insect types. But the bilateral flowers tend to be a little bit more selective. There's not quite as many insects that can take advantage of that type of flower morphology. So that was a pretty easy distinction to look at is do, do differences in flower morphology within the garden or the shapes of the flowers, does that, does that make a difference? Mm -hmm. And then native status, of course. Native status is a huge thing for everybody. Native is a big hot button term. Overwhelmingly, the support is in the plant native category for, for many, many reasons. But again, when we're talking about people at home, in their yard, with homeowners associations, not everybody has the ability to plant all native. And a lot of our native things aren't as attractive as some of our non-natives and our cultivars. So we need to know, does it matter if your pollinator garden is primarily um, non-natives or if you should really truly stick to only native plants? It's an important question to ask. It's an important question to answer. And I think we're getting there with a definitive answer, but there's still quite a bit of research in that area. I think my best synopsis is if you have the option plant native, um, if your options are limited, if it's just not gonna work for your space, you can plant cultivars, you can plant non-native species, they're gonna benefit some insects. Bees in particular, generalist pollinators, they don't really have a preference. They will visit a, a non-native aster uh, just as easily as they will a native aster. Asters, again, that's sunflowers. That's your really super generalist, um, very common plant. Flowers in the Asteraceae family made up 70% of all of the species in my research project. So by and large, they're the dominant species that are being planted in gardens. Um, the easy way for a, you at home to know that know what an aster is. Asters have compound flowers. There's multiple flowers. A sunflower is a poster child for Asteraceae family. But goldenrod is also Asteraceae. So they're not always presented as that big, beautiful, perfectly symmetrical flower. But um, functionally, they fill a lot of the same roles. Oh, yeah. And that aster family is just is so huge and so complex. It just makes up a lot of a lot of the plants out there in general, um, even out in nature. I mean, there's a huge number of plants that are in that aster family. It's like I said before, it's very complex. So it only makes sense that then there's a lot of them that we now have in our gardens, whether that is in a mostly native or purely native pollinator garden and landscape that we're forming, or whether it's with our more traditional exotic plants that are often planted out there. There's just a lot out there with the aster. So in a way that doesn't surprise me that that's what a lot of what your, your gardens were. No, absolutely. I, that was not a surprising find, but it, that is the, like you say, that, that's the state that that's a very dominant plant family and, and in our region, especially. Exactly. So I want to talk about some of your findings because you've kind of alluded to some of them and touched on some of them already. And I want to hear what some of the ones that you found most interesting were, but one of the ones that I really found interesting and that I want to make sure we talk about was kind of the concept of flower diversity, because one of the things that you found was that having greater flower diversity was one of the major driving factors for attracting the pollinators. And that makes a lot of sense on one hand, just logically, because if you have a lot of different types of flowers, then you have the potential of bringing in more of your specialist species that depend on a certain plant species or a certain plant genus or family. And we've got a lot of specialist species out there. On the other hand, I've always heard that you need to plant multiples of the same species in order to attract your pollinators in. And there's a lot of different reasons that go into that kind of attracting the pollinators in. 
Now, obviously that can be taken to an extreme. We don't want big monocultures of the same thing out there. But I'm wondering if with the flower diversity that can also be taken to an extreme and that even though you may have a small garden and very limited space, you don't wanna plant one of everything. You still wanna have at least a few of everything. Um, is that true or how, how small yeah. can you take that down into? I think, I think that, that that's, a, that's a fair line of logic. If, if you have a very limited space, planting one, of a, one each of 100 different species probably isn't gonna benefit very many. Um, it's not a very targeted approach at making, making a, a big difference. In both instances, you, you might be better off to focus on a target species or to pick five or, or six or eight species to give you that diversity. And um, diversity is probably the key term for this talk. And the key term that everybody needs to keep in mind when they go out to their garden is, is diversity is, is, is such an important factor. And when we say diversity, we're talking now about species diversity of plants. There's so many more aspects than just species diversity. You, again, floral symmetry. Color, color is such a huge cue yes. for certain insect groups. And, and then height, texture. You wanna include grasses in pollinator gardens because, because grasses are habitat for, for so many of our insect groups and shelter and cover. So there's, there's so much to, to try to get your head around, but diversity is key in all aspects of diversity. So if you can't plant a hundred different species, pick a couple of good focal species, something that's going to offer rewards. You want to be diverse in what you're offering. You want to try to offer nectar rewards and pollen rewards. Not all pollinators are in search of pollen. Pollen is a protein source. Nectar is an energy source. So some some organisms are highly energy dependent and they're going to seek out those highly rewarding nectar sources. Others are mostly focused on getting that pollen. And for some organisms like bees, it can vary depending on the time of year. And sometimes of the year, they're very in need of pollen to feed young. And then and sometimes they need that energy to keep going, to keep foraging. So it's, uh, it's not a one size fits all thing for any of these organisms but keeping it diverse. Make sure you have something that blooms early in spring and something that stays blooming late in fall. Mm -hmm. Catching those two ends, those asters that we talked about, those are awesome summer flowers, but we need some of those spring ephemerals and, and we need some of that stuff that hangs on there till the very last in fall to get those early spring. Mo most of our lawn weeds are not native plants but they're hugely important for early season, early foragers. Those clovers and uh, dandelions in the spring, that's early resources for these early foragers. So think about diversity in those terms as well. If you can only plant four or five species, try to make sure that they're different, that, that you've got bilateral and radial symmetry, that you've got multiple colors. Plant what you can, where you can. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of diversity and with what you can do with your space, think outside the box, think outside your garden bed. If you wanna increase diversity in your landscape, you may only need to not mow as frequently, leave one section of your yard a little bit unattended. Um, let some of those native weeds that the pollinators love have some space. Maybe it's the part of your garden you, you don't have to look at, the backyard, the back corner, but those forgotten spaces are probably some of the best habitat for insect pollen. Yeah, and a lot of that goes into, especially those little bit taller, a little bit wilder areas. I mean, that can be the overwintering habitat in some cases, because we really focus on flowers, when we talk about our pollinator gardens, but there's just so much more that really goes into making good pollinator habitat. I mean, you've got to have that nesting habitat, which isn't flowers. 
you have to have that overwintering habitat, which again, I mean, if it's winter, okay, Kentucky and Tennessee, we don't get real winters, according to my friends and family up north. Um, <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. Um, Me too. But still, it gets cold. We don't have flowers blooming all year long here. So you've got to have all that other stuff as well when we're talking about pollinator habitat and looking at, like you said, going beyond just the flower flowers themselves in the flower garden. I mean, the trees, you're a tree person, but yeah. trees are so vital to so many of our pollinators, not just in the form of the flowers that they have, but also for that, that baby food, as I call it, for the host plants, for the butterflies, or for any other many, many different reasons like that. Absolutely. So, so many of our, our native and regional insects are tied closely to certain plant species, the spicebush swallowtail, um, the catalpa sphinx moth. There are so many of those relationships that they don't involve the plants during their flowering phase. They're, they're vegetative matter that the larvae feed on, they're overwintering sites for eggs, um, that, uh, that habitat so we talk again. We're talking about pollinator gardens, and the automatic assumption is that we're we're referring to the flowers that are in these gardens. But pollinator gardens are habitat, so we we need to think about things like nesting sites. There, the spectrum of requirements for insects and pollinators is is enormous. We, we, there are solitary ground nesting insects. There are social bees like bumblebees and, and honeybees that live in big hives. But the majority of our, our native insects, the, our, really our native bees do the brunt of pollination. In North America, especially, again, honeybees aren't native to this continent. They, they are super valuable for economy, for agriculture, but they are not native. Our native bees were responsible for the brunt of pollination services in North America for all of our native plants. Uh, most of our uh, native plants aren't, uh, are adapted to our native insect morphotypes. So by, in, by including these more diverse plantings, <clears throat> you mentioned a, a, a little while ago that you increase this opportunity to include these specialist in insects. So gardens that are dominated by aster flowers, they're providing a huge service. They're, they're providing resources for a, a large number and multiple groups of pollinating insects. But if we can add one species that's a, that has a specialist pollinator, then we're increasing biodiversity in our site by including somebody that was not invited to the party before. So we were kind of talking about this before we started recording, you were talking about your finding on the size of the gardens. Can you share that with us some? Because I think that's, a lot yes. of our listeners would be very interested in hearing that. And in many cases might be a little relieved to hear that. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, that's probably one of the, the most daunting things when people set out to do, a, to, to create a pollinator garden is, you know, I've only got so many square feet. I studied 17 sites. The smallest site was eight by eight. The largest site was, my goodness, these people had acres and acres. There was a there was a huge pollinator plantings all the way around their house. And then they also had, a, a I think, a three acre meadow. So it was enormous. But the one thing that I found through all of this is that size really didn't matter. The overall abundance of insects visiting pollinator gardens, it didn't change whether I was in a meadow or I was on the corner of the street in Asheville, North Carolina, it, it didn't make a difference. Pollinators were visiting flowers. So if you're limited in size, that's not a limitation. The only limitation you have with a small yard is your ability to envision your, the change that you can make. If you've got a small plot, think about things, even if you're a vegetable gardener, if you can just add a row of marigolds or add a row of sunflowers or don't weed quite as often as you might like to. Those are all things that, that can make a difference in a small space. So don't think that just because you live in an apartment in downtown 
that, that you can't contribute to mitigating pollinator decline. Container gardens, flowers grow great in containers and insects live in cities. That was the thing. You had, you had mentioned attractiveness and, and there's this big drive for people and, and, and myself included, um, we, we have this, this desire to attract pollinators to our pollinator garden. And my advisor brought that up to me uh, not too long ago. He, he, he said something about the, to the effect of, you know, what, what we're doing to attract pollinators. And um, I, I'd like to introduce a concept of maybe we shouldn't work so hard to try to force something to happen. Let's not think about attracting pollinators to our garden. Let's think about what we can do to our garden to make it a more favorable space for the insects that already occupy the space. Urban areas are not favorable for a, for a lot of insects, but for some groups, they thrive. Cavity nesters love urban environments. Bricks and concrete, cracks and crevices make perfect homes for cavity nesting insects. They're gonna be present in your urban garden. So go outside, take a look around, take a look at, walk through the park. Look at what kinds of insects you're seeing. Those are the things that are around your house. You're probably not going to be able to attract a monarch butterfly off of its flight path, no matter how much milkweed you plant in your backyard, if you're living in an area that they just aren't in. So think about ways that you can just improve habitat for anything that might be there. We don't need to attract all the honeybees in the neighborhood. We don't need to attract all the bumblebees in the neighborhood. We need to make sure that what we have in our backyard has something to eat, a place to reproduce, and a place to be safe. Mm -hmm. Provide them structure, fight the urge to, to blow your yard clean in the fall with every leaf that falls in the grass. If you've got a corner of your yard that you can blow that stuff to, let it lay. It'll do good and you don't need any more space than what you're already using. You just have to think about how you're using it. All right. With that, I mean, some of our native bees, well, pretty much all of our native bees, how far they can fly from their nesting site depends on the size of the bee itself. Some of our native bees, they're what I very technically term as gnat size because yeah. they're so teeny tiny. They look like little gnats until you really start looking at them. And you go, oh, wait a minute, that's a, that's a bee. Um, that's not a gnat, but teeny tiny little things. So they may only be able to fly a few hundred yards from their nesting site, which means that many people's yard may be that bee's entire world. And that becomes pretty powerful. You're not going Absolutely. to attract it over from the neighbor's yard. You're going to be providing everything that bee needs, needs right there on your own property. Absolutely. That's, um, uh, this is a podcast, so I don't have the ability to show visuals. But as part of my thesis presentation, I have a visual. The majority of our native bees, they're confined to a few city blocks. They might visit your neighbor's house. They might go two or three doors down but they're not going across town. Bumblebees and honeybees, they can fly for about five kilometers. They can forage a few city blocks, maybe the majority of a city. So they've got a good bit of area. Some of the challenges that these small bodied, short distance bees face aren't faced by bees that have the ability to get up and go away. And the same with moths and butterflies, they, they, they have, long foraging pests. They, they tend to, to migrate and, and move long distances. But the bulk of what we're trying to save, it doesn't move out of your yard, out of your town. It's stuck right there in your backyard. So anything you can do to make your backyard more habitable for these insects is going to help everything overall. Right. We have influence over our yard. Increasing pollinator habitat, citywide, statewide, nationwide, those are big issues. If you want to be involved in that, there's plenty of opportunity. Become an advocate, talk to your neighbors, dispel the illusion that wasps are bad and that hornets are the devil. Um, 
they're, they all have a place. We need to try to live with them and encourage them. Unfortunately, we live in close proximity to a lot of insects that don't always enjoy company, but they still deserve space. A lot of what I find when I talk to individuals or when I'm scrolling through the comments on social media, um, honeybees are great, bumblebees are great, wasps are very bad, and my goodness, yellow jackets are the scourge of the earth. And so this dialogue has been built in, in society that, that sort of paints some of these organisms in a negative light. And uh, it, we, we, we really need to try as, as individuals, we can influence that. When you see somebody that's terrified of the wasp nest on the corner of their house, volunteer to go over there in the evening and remove it for them. <laughs> There's so much that, that can be done to just change perception. Mm -hmm. One of the first podcasts that I did, we talked to Heather Holm about wasps in her new book. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of great information if people want to go back and listen to that. Because I mean, Heather's got such wonderful information about all sorts of pollinators and wasps are such underappreciated pollinators and members of the whole community and the different ecosystem services that they provide. Yes. And, and a lot, and you know, a lot of wasps are carnivores. They, they're not as a group, they're not huge contributors to pollination, but they do contribute. And there are some native wasps that are very specialized. Um, yes. There's a black banded, uh, a white banded black wasp. I can't think of the scientific name right now, but it looks meaner than the devil. But I've stood in a field of mint with hundreds of them and they didn't have any interest in me whatsoever. Beautiful insects but very specialized on mint family plants. Yeah. Yeah. It was standing in the goldenrod fields, taking pictures of the butterflies and the bees that got me over my fear of wasps because I mean, they were completely ignoring me. They were very much all about gathering the nectar, hunting for caterpillars and stuff, doing their own thing. And I was like, Oh, wait a minute. That one looks like a jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> that one looks like a panda bear. <laughs> and then that was, like I said, in the other, uh, when I was talking to Heather, I mean, that's what got me over and got me started really going, Ooh, I want to learn more. That's, um, that's powerful. That's a powerful experience. And I, I think that, um, that, that really, cause I, I, again, going into this, I was a tree guy and, and wasps are the enemy when you're off the ground and no way to run. But, um, the, the time in the field really, helps to make those connections and it helps to realize how these insects function. When they're out gathering resources, you are the last thing on their mind. They are dedicated, they have purpose, and that's what they're doing. They are not interested in seeking you out to cause you harm or chase you down. It's only in those unfortunate circumstances where we run across their home or we do something to invade their space that they feel a need to retaliate. So it's just like you and me, we don't let anybody come into our house. We're gonna get upset if we come home and find somebody parked in our doorway. Not any different for those guys. But if you give them their space and take time to appreciate them, between standing in the field and hand netting and, and putting these things into small tubes, I didn't ever got, I never got stung in two summers doing this. I have not been stung, still not been stung collecting insects. Um, so my fear of stinging insects has diminished greatly after collecting so many of them. But looking at them under the microscope and realizing how complex and how, how specifically adapted to the job that they're doing, these insects are. You can, it, looking at a green June beetle flying around outside in the, in the summer, you would not think that these insects were as hairy as they are. But when you look at, look at these small things under a microscope where you can get up close and personal, you can really, really start to appreciate the diversity, the complexity, and the purpose that they serve. One of the things that you had mentioned earlier that I wanted to come back to was the idea that in the urban areas, those cavity nesters, were really big there yes. because it has so much good habitat for them. 
And that kind of implies that the composition of species was different in different areas. Can you talk a little bit about what you found with that and how that might have changed throughout the gardens? I mean, it's not that any group is better than another. It's just that they're different. And so how did some of those differences play out? Absolutely. Not all pollinators are created equally. <laughs> there, there are so many factors involved, how they, what their nesting habit, how our habits are, their body size, their wing structure, their food preferences. So changing one aspect of a habitat or changing uh, the use of a certain land space isn't going to affect all of its occupants equally. Some organisms are going to have a really hard time with paving the field. Others, maybe not so much. Some of them, like I say, the large-bodied insects, they can move to another habitat. They can fly over unfavorable land, but the small stuff, they really can't. One thing that I noticed, um, edge effect. Edge effect is is a big factor in a lot of ecological studies or urban studies right now is how much edge is there to our forests within this space. With land use, with habitat, transitioning from one land use type to another, there's this transition zone. That's the edge. So that's where our lawns meet our forests. And in that edge is a whole bunch of underbrush. You, anybody in Eastern United States you drive down the road midsummer, and it's a completely different landscape than what you were looking at over winter. You cannot see into our forests because of the edge. The density of plant material at that edge is so much higher than it is as you move into the forest. So edge is a critical habitat for a lot of species. It provides them a means to move under cover, and it also can then provide nesting habitats and forage if there are flowering species in that space, but it gives them cover and it gives them a means to move from one place to another. So we looked at edge habitat and it had a, a big effect on bumblebees in particular. Well, bumblebees and other insects, I should say, and what I saw, again, there was no difference in the overall number. There was a ton of insects. It didn't matter if the garden was right against the woods or if it was far away from the woods. There were still a lot of, a high abundance of insects. But what was different about the gardens is what groups were represented. As you start to move your pollinator garden away from those undisturbed habitats, the edge, edges of the woods, you start to see less and less representation of our small native bees, our beetles, our hoverflies. Um, flies are a huge group of pollinators I completely left out. <laughs> flies are super important and they don't all look like our butterflies. Lots of bee mimics, lots of things. So those other insects, the proportion of other insects was much higher in gardens that were closer to those edge habitats. So they, they had more resources available to them. As you start to move farther away, we started to see a lot more bumblebees. Bumblebees, again, have that ability to move long distances. So if your garden is a kilometer away from a bumblebee's nest site, it's not a huge obstacle for them. They're going to find that garden. But all of those little bees that tend to harbor at those woodland edges can't make it. They just don't have the energy reserves and the flight capacity to make it to those resources. So we, start, we saw a, a change. And across the board, that was, that was the result that we got most often, was just a shift in proportional representation. And the bumblebees were the ones that we saw the, the, that effect in the most. They were the most affected by distance to vegetation, they were the most affected by the proportion of native flowers. They were the most affected by the proportion of radial flowers. So as a group, bumblebees seemed to be very responsive to some of these factors. But in reality, I think what we're, what we're seeing is just more favorable habitat for some of those lesser capable insects. So they fill the greater proportion of the population in those spaces. As far as abundance goes, or 
this no difference. I didn't see a difference in the numbers of insects. I, I want to make a caveat with that. Me as a researcher, I was limited in my ability to record the number of insects visiting a garden. So I think that there is a threshold there. There's an observational threshold, the amount of insects that any one person can count in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. So that is something to not ignore. I would venture to guess that there were some differences in population sizes between sites. But visitation rate, the amount of insects visiting at any one time, it was a constant, at least from one, one observer's perspective. Oh, and then every habitat is going to have a carrying capacity. So the number of insects that can be supported by a habitat is finite. <clears throat> so in those areas that had a more diverse amount of resources, the insects that that habitat favored were found in high numbers or higher proportions. Insects that had options had options. So they maybe were being pushed out or overcompeted. Bumblebees and honeybees and some of those types of insects, they've got options, they're very efficient foragers, and they're very um, highly tuned to the flowers that they forage, their preferences. So it's quite likely that they were just moving on to something that was less competitive for them. Yeah, that's one of the great things, um, interesting things, frustrating things, all in one about ecological research and working out in the field like this is that there are so many factors that we really can't control, but that's real life. And it's looking at, looking at figuring out, okay, what are the factors that actually mean something here? And what are all these other factors that could come into play. I mean, like you said, there's a limit to how many insects you can count or how many that area can support. And if it really supports a bunch of one specific type, then other things are going to go elsewhere and not be able to support it. Right. Yes. There, there are two broad categories of pollinators. And I've mentioned those, these terms a few times, generalists and specialists. Mm -hmm. Generalists are not picky eaters. They'll visit anything that provides them an opportunity. Specialists are much more selective. Specialist insects will visit a lot of generalized flower types, but they tend to have preferential host plants. So these generalist insects, it's, it's not that big a deal for them if they have options to go somewhere else. The specialists don't have a lot of choice. So if we focus I guess, our efforts on supporting some of these more specialized insect groups by planting some more florally diverse native plants, things that have co-evolved with these insects, then we're bolstering one side of the equation without hurting the other side. The other side, those generalists, they'll visit any flower you plant if they can get the rewards from it. They're not picky. Mm -hmm. So do what we can on the specialist side. Get the diversity in there. Get the native plants in there. And with natives, I'm a big proponent of natives. But the big reason I'm advocating native plantings are, are those specialist relationships. From my perspective, a lot of the research that we do in our lab, we, we look at plant-insect interaction networks. So we're looking at sections of land and how the insects are interacting with the species on that land. And a lot of what we're looking at are links and connections. And those broken links are the things that we want to avoid. So if we can help by planting native plants, if we can help support native insects, we may be able to avoid breaking one of those small but very critical links in our network. Right. And like a lot of Talamase research is coming out now, it's not just about the pollinators themselves and insects on pretty flowers. It's the caterpillars eating the host plants. And a lot of times that's a, that's like you said, that's that specialized link. We may not think of it because caterpillars are eating the plants. They're not pretty butterflies at that point or pretty moths. But 
those caterpillars are then important for the songbird nestlings. And it just kind of ripples on up and those links go in multiple directions and sometimes in ways that we don't always think of, especially when we're saying, oh, I want to plant a pollinator garden. Absolutely. And, and um, yeah, you touched on with the birds, you know, insects are, are a primary food source for, for bird life. Mm -hmm. So whether they're actively involved in pollination or not, they're still a critical part of this ecological web that, that keeps everything functioning, that keeps all of the parts working together. So again, with pollinator gardens and ecology and conservation plantings, we're doing a disservice to our planet and our people if we're focused on saving a key species. If, if we spend our efforts and our imaginations focusing on trying to save one critical key species, while we're looking the other direction, we may be losing tens or hundreds or thousands of critical links that we're just not seeing because we're focused in the wrong direction. Yeah, there's just so many different links. We kind of got to look at everything. And that's, that's hard to do, especially when you may only have a limited, I mean, we've all got limited space, but when you have limited space, it's, it can be difficult because then it becomes overwhelming that, oh, I've got to do everything. But no, in that case, focus on what you can do and just realize that there's more than just a single species, no matter what that single species is. Yes, always in, in all aspects of conscious. Well, we've talked about a lot of different topics and touched on a lot of different things related to pollinator gardens and stuff here. In looking at your research specifically, are there other things that you think that would be very applicable and helpful for us as homeowners who want to do more for pollinators and want to be able to apply that kind of scientific research that's coming out? Are there pieces that we haven't talked about with your research and your findings that you think we should touch on real quick? You know, I think the big picture is really is everything we do contributes. Plant what you can, plant containers, and keep the big picture. But aside from all of that, regardless of whether you can plant a square foot or an acre, share your passion with other people. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your garden clubs, talk to your church groups. If you're active in city council, if you're active in local politics, encourage the city to set aside space on their land. Come up with a volunteer group, some people that'll, that'll manage that space. Don't make it a burden to the city, make it a benefit to the city. If you'll give us 200 square feet, we'll maintain it, we'll plant it with flowers. You don't have to worry about it. That way, that's not your yard, but you can still be involved. Well, thanks a lot. I've had fun talking with you. And so I will have a link to your thesis in the show notes for people if they want to go and read that and see more about what your findings were and see if they can pull out any more pieces that they might be able to apply in their own yards. And if people have questions or want to learn more about your research and what you're up to, can they contact you? Yes, watsont at etsu.edu. Sounds great. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. And unless you've got anything else that you want to add real quick, I'll say thanks a lot and have a great day. Thank you very much for having me. I have really enjoyed it. And you have a great day as well. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I appreciate Travis taking time to talk with us today. I'm glad that more people are starting to study pollinator gardens from a scientific standpoint. Most of the people I know who create pollinator gardens or other large-scale pollinator plantings, myself included, are doing so partly just because we enjoy watching the pollinators and other wildlife that visit the garden. But often just as importantly, if not more so, we're doing it because we want to make a difference for the pollinators and other animals that call that space home. 
But how do we know that what we are doing with those pollinator gardens or other plantings is making a difference or doing any good at all? Could we possibly even be doing unintentional harm by creating ecological sinks or traps, which are just scientific terms for when an area either doesn't produce a sustainable population or when the environmental cues that a species relies on to choose its habitat are no longer in line with the true quality of the habitat? These are tough questions to ask ourselves and tough questions to try and study from a scientific perspective as well. As a scientist, I really enjoy finding scientific research that addresses these and similar questions. I think Travis's findings that overall insect abundance remained relatively constant at all of his study sites, and that insect composition was what changed the most between sites, is very interesting. I think it also highlights the danger of lumping all pollinators together or using one or two species as poster children and assuming if they are doing well, then everyone else is too. Ecology is just way too complicated to make those types of assumptions. The good news is that we are learning more and more as scientists are increasingly conducting research on and in pollinator gardens and other similar types of habitats. I look forward to continuing to follow the research and implement the findings on my own property, as well as sharing that research with you. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask a favor of you. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider joining our community of supporters. There are many ways you can support Backyard Ecology, both financially and non-financially. Learn more at www.backyardecology.net slash join dash us, or just go to the webpage for this episode and you'll see a button there with this information. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.